All right, folks, how are we doing? It's Shabash. It's Hero of Aetheric, which has been out for just over a week. And I can say that I was indeed first person to reach tier 10. Uh, and uh, in this video, I want to explain how I did that. And at the very least, hopefully, at least one of you finds a useful tip here or there. And uh, maybe another person found this an interesting story on what was not really uh, a super uh, busy race to tier 10. <laughs> anyway, uh, before we start, I do want to say that I don't really care about what anyone says with this being a more casual game compared to Orna and that you should play it slow, enjoy it the way, uh, whatever way you want. And look, I had tons of fun grinding hard and fast. I mean, who doesn't? For the for that one week, I had just over four days of playtime to reach tier 10. And I really had fun going as fast as possible, and that's how I had fun with it myself, exploring the world of Aetheric. You know, I only went to tier 3 or tier 4 in the beta uh, to leave me room for exploring the world of Aetheric uh, when it went live in early access. And yeah, plenty of discovery there, so please have fun however you want. Uh, that's what games are for, we don't need to compare between anyone. We all go at our own pace, and that is what it is. Uh, with that semi-disclaimer out the way, I guess, let's have a, a quick summary of what I'll be covering uh, in this video. Basically, there's a, there's a few tips and tricks which I discovered. Uh, for example, zone resetting uh, to get fresh bosses and uh, clickables, like this uh, fountain. You can change that quite easily. Uh, monsters as well, to a lesser ex extent. Chaos scrolls, I realize they're actually very important uh, for easy leveling. And I'll explain why later. And then focusing on world bosses because they respawn immediately, unlike after three hours in Orna. And it kind of like simulates traveling as a passenger in a moving vehicle in Orna. So there's a lot of people who will be playing Aetheric who, because they can't get that uh, moving in a vehicle experience in Orna, which is so much more efficient, so much faster at grinding than just walking around in Orna. I think everybody knows that. But at least in Aetheric, you can get a similar experience because bosses spawn, uh, respawn in the zone immediately. Now, my initial plans going in were either to go a pet class or swashbuckler because you can pretty much wear full farming gear with very trash gear and you can still dish out damage. You can still kill stuff. So that was the plan. And then because I went, I ended up going pet class uh, tier 7. Uh, I did a little... I found a nice little cheeky way to try and force pets, uh, the pets that I wanted. So I'll go over how I did that. And but overall, you still got to grind, still got to grind hard. Uh, it is still kind of an Orna based game, so there's a lot of grinding. Um, one last full disclaimer before we start getting into the story and stuff is regarding pay to win aspect. So there is the rune shop in the game, and I did spend a bit of money. On this, uh, the last week, I spent a total of uh, five pounds thirty-five Great British pounds. I uh, bought a total of ten shrines, two of which I use Google Play points, and not all of those were Wisdom shrines. I, I bought a couple of Luck shrines just to make sure I had uh, Orns, I guess, for the next class up. But yeah, so I bought a few Wisdom shrines to double my experience. However. I guess with the zone resetting uh, above, I actually ran into a lot of shrines on the ground. And the biggest thing in Hero of Aetheric is that shrines stack together. So at some points I had over three hours worth of double shrines just from finding them on the ground. And that was really, uh, really important for, for pushing through tier eight, tier nine and into tier 10. So getting into the, I guess the actual strategy and uh, the actual story uh, for this push as you can see, I am using blue stacks, which compared to mobile gives you, I don't know, 10 times more vision on the map. And it is allowed compared to Orna. So definitely need to use that because you can see where the bosses spawn. Here's one, here's another boss. And uh, yeah, you can see all the mobs with quest that you need, that you need to kill, for example. So, so that's the first thing. How to zoom out in blue stacks or other emulators, by the way, it's actually the opposite of Orna on mobile. You need to lower your DPI settings in the emulator, which was uh, quite interesting. So uh, I'm this is currently, I think, 140 DPI sitting on, and I can see almost this whole zone uh, in Mountains of Jotunheim. 
So it wasn't actually until I reached maybe tier five or tier six on like day three that I decided to start going hard for first tier 10. Until then, to be honest, I was playing pretty casually with some folk from Orna Legends and from my ex Orna Kingdom and uh, found myself in like top 25 global or something like that and said, fuck it, let's do it. Uh, works fairly quiet this week, let's push for tier 10. And uh, I ended up finding an ornate Black Witch Staff from uh, Carmen here in this area, tier 6. And that kind of, that ornate with the high experience, that kind of got the ball rolling, if you like. And I actually then found an ornate Masamune from a Ronin in this same area, this same zone, which I then traded in a trading post and I got an, a second ornate Black Witch Staff out of it. So I ended up having two Black Witch Staffs which I still use uh, currently uh, if I'm grinding out experience. Uh, so here's one, here's the second one. So I leveled them up a little bit with the whetstones to level three. Then when I went to bed, put them in the blacksmith to level four. Uh, if you dual wield two bonus weapons of roughly the same quality, you will actually end up positive uh, with greater bonuses than if you were just to wield one of them. Um, so up until this point, I was planning to go swash and I'd actually reached, uh, bought my blade master tier six class. So I was farm farming tier six zone here as a blade master berserker. But then I found a war horse in, uh, Bestry at home, which is tier seven, um, war horse, uh, legendary rarity pets. So I kind of pivoted to full pet build and, uh, went Beastmaster spec, which is the kind of tier seven followers Valhalla spec, which uh, increases your pet power and makes them attack more often, increases their action rate. And I actually went back to tier five class, uh, the Dragoon, because they, yeah, basically stack together to increase the power of your pet with Valhalla and Wei. Uh, your follower is slightly stronger and attacks more often. So tier five class, tier seven spec, tier seven pet and I actually stayed Dragoon well into tier seven until I could buy finally buy Dragon Knight, uh, which is the uh, tier, yeah, the tier seven uh, pet class. Luckily needs Blade Master or Battle Mage. So I already had Blade Master, but I did kind of miss out. Did a lot of grinding here just as a tier five class. During this time, I was trying out the tier seven area uh, Murkheim uh, but the bosses are quite sporadic. It's, you see, it's a very large area. Plus, there was a bug for the first few days where there was a fog of war here to reach the tier 10 area. A lot of time, the bosses would spawn in the fog of war and you couldn't reach them. So I didn't know how to reset zones at the time. But basically, I ended up getting a legendary Reaper's Robe from an Anku, which I'm still wearing. And I kind of realized that it was much better to farm the tier 6 zone in Jotunheim because uh, you'd kill the bosses much faster. And I would spend yeah a long time basically going back and forth, killing uh, Cerberus, let the Warhorse do the damage, and uh, then always walking, by the way, always walking in between kills. And you can see here, uh, well, I, I, I see one boss is a bit further away, so typically go for the nearest boss. Also, this zone is pretty good because very often you can reach bosses across these non-passable mountains and pretty decent area to farm from tier six all the way until tier eight. So yeah, jump across, grab this boss here and you can reach it there. And I guess it was around close kind of mid tier seven. I spent hours here, you know, walking up here, walking all the way over here, walking back, uh, it felt, it felt slow. Felt quite slow because uh, you wait for the bosses to respawn, and uh, yeah, I felt like there might must have been quicker way. But anyway, it was while I was farming these bosses, I realized how to reset bosses because either you would run into a berserk that you couldn't kill, or more often, especially in the tier seven zone in Murkheim, as I, as I said, I would you know sometimes still go back there, but they would spawn out of reach uh, in the fog of war here, which is now. I'm pretty sure has been fixed by the way. So what I realized was I was still joining other parties with people 
uh, doing dungeons and stuff. And I realized that when you joined other parties that uh, the bosses would change their location. They would like basically reset monsters as well, would reset and uh, other places and clickables and then kind of respawn in other places in the zone. And this is basically when I realized, yeah, how to reset the zone. And I think I saw a message from, uh, I saw a comment from Odie in the Discord. It's basically when you join someone's party, you effectively join their world. Uh, so that's what you're seeing. You're seeing someone else's world. So the monsters all switch to what's uh, their screen. Now, what I realized was as well, and I'll, I'll, don't worry, I'll show you how to do this in, in just a second. But um, yeah, the core thing to reset is you need to join a new party, basically. Uh, joining a fresh new party that resets everything, bosses, monsters, and clickable items as well. So you see the, the tree here and the chest here, those are clickable items. Now, so what I started to do was uh, I actually used an alt on my phone to send a party invite to my main on Bluestacks and accept that party invite each time. Uh, but it's quite clunky switching between two devices. And I then realized that another way to actually uh, create a new party is just by sending a party invite creates a party. No one actually has to join the party on the other side for it to be created. It's already created when you're, as long as you're not in a party initially, and then you send a new invite, that is what creates and resets the zone. Uh, that creates the new party and that basically resets the zone. So this is the uh, method I use to show you how to reset the zone from your main account. Very easy. So I'm in a party right now. What you do, you go in the menu, disband party. So that leaves the party. And this in itself will take you back to like your solo world if you like. But what we're going to do is go in your ally list and I've got a couple of alts here. You invite them to party. I actually went on my alt and uh, sent a message here so I can easily find them in my ally list. You, you probably don't need to have that problem if you don't have many friends or you have too many alts. So we are, we are now in a new party, uh, but you don't need to do anything on the alt. And what we're going to do is going to wait a little bit, roughly up to 20 seconds, I kind of, as a guesstimate, let's say. And all everything here is going to reset. Boom, there you go. So new bosses, new monsters, new clickables. So there's a chest there, uh, another chest down there. And uh, one boss here, one boss up here, and one other boss down there. I started doing this for a while, and then I realized that it takes such a long time for things to respawn sometimes. Is there, is there a way I can make this quicker? And the answer is yes, there is a way. So what we're going to do, disband the party again, uh, send out another invite. So we're basically starting the whole process from scratch. Now you see there, actually, the server ticked over straight away there. Uh, but that's not going to happen every time. So boom, party invite, and then you leave and play again, go back into the game, and that resets everything immediately. So there we go. We've got a Ronin up here, Carmen down there, and we can't see the third boss in the zone, so it's probably down uh, south here in the corner section. Or no, he's right there. He's right there, sorry. So two Ronins there. So that's the fast way to uh, basically reset bosses. So I, I, I did this action thousands of times over the last week or so. So I mainly started using this actually when I reached uh, tier eight. Um, so if we this this uh, this is the this is the the tier eight zone. This is lioness zone. However, uh, this is not equal zone. Uh, you basically have there's two sections. There's the west side, which is all of this, and then this is the eastern strip. I call it. Uh, which actually starts pretty much as soon as you enter it from Jotunheim. So we're going to go there because this is where I farmed all the way up to tier 10. From tier 8 all the way to tier 10, it's going to be in this zone. Um, now at this point, yeah, I still had the Warhorse pet. When I reached tier 8, I tried out the new magic weapons. I, I just had a magic hammer and a so I just tried that out and that was 
pretty fantastic pet. Give like consistent three and a half k to four k hits every turn. Uh, I'm sure Magic Sword or Magic Dagger would be the same. And you want you really want consistent damage. I mean, Warhorse it didn't attack every turn, and uh, there seems to be two bosses in this area now. Uh, I think there was only one the other day. So yeah, basically, I started checking out the tier eight zone, and as we're going up here, I yeah came to the conclusion that in this eastern strip, there's a max of three bosses, and in this whole entire western side. You can see the area is like, I don't know, five times bigger, maybe more. And I don't even know what the max bosses is. I think it's maybe three as well. But the bosses can be, you can have, you can have a boss here, you can have a boss here, you can have a boss down here, you can have a boss here. Uh, it can just, you know, it's just so spread out. So quickly came to the realization that this eastern strip is the best place to farm in tier 8. You can just go back and forward, back and forward. And you always know, you know you're never going to miss a boss. Like... If you're on the west side here and you just go here, let's say you just go down, you cruise down this western line, north to south, pretty soon you're going to have bosses spawning way over here. And to get from here to here, you can't go this way. You can't go through here. You have to go all the way up around and down here. You know, in the time it takes, takes you to do that, you could have killed 10 bosses, maybe more, on the eastern strip without playing efficiently, by the way. So there's a cockatrice up there. So this eastern strip, I'll show you where it ends, uh, because it starts, it starts basically right here as soon as you enter from Jotunheim area, and it ends on the map. It ends uh, like here, the line here. You will see bosses spawn just west of this little forest area. Uh, so yeah, they're here. They, they spawn just here, and then there's like a dead zone. Uh, if I show you on the map, it's like a dead zone here where nothing spawns at all, which is just awful. Okay, so this is the uh, the Eastern Lioness Strip. Now, explaining how I use the, the zone resetting effectively, as I said, there's only three three bosses that spawn in this entire zone. Now, we've got two Cockatrice here, and the other Cockatrice is way over here. So if I kill these two bosses, they, they can respawn, and they can be way over here, which still takes a good 30, 40 seconds to, to go over there by walking. So what I would do is, if there was two bosses to kill, if there was at least two bosses to kill in a very short area, uh, such as this, there are two bosses basically side by side, you can kill them. Uh, okay, one respawn, the guy respawned automatically straight away, so let's walk over there, kill that. So as long as there was two bosses in the same area, I would stay in this party, kill them, clear them out. And if I'd killed at least two bosses, sometimes you get three all in one, what you can do is immediately leave and re-enter the game and that resets uh, the server tick and boom, the, you've got two immediate spawns. Rather than waiting another 15, 20 seconds to see where they spawn, you would probably be walking east back to kill that one other boss, but instead, within five seconds, you're killing another two bosses. So repeat that, leave, rejoin. And we, okay, we got kind of lucky still. There's still two bosses in this area. We, I guess we just keep going until there's uh, not two bosses in this area. So one down and uh, the Rakul. So leave respawn. I, I see another boss on the, just on the eastern side. Okay, so now look, the bosses haven't respawned here at all. So we know, I saw one in the corner, uh, which was just, out of sight there. And the, remember the other one from the start was way over here. So instead of walking all the way over there, now is the time that you reset the zone. Disband the party, uh, go to your ally list. Of course, you can send a random invite to anybody, uh, but to be polite, send it to uh, a character that uh, doesn't want to receive invites necessarily. And boom, we got a fresh boss. Uh, what I would do, as you may know, Heimdall is uh, worth like double the experience in Orns as the other tier eight bosses. So if a Heim if that Fafnir was a Heimdall, I would walk over there and kill it. Every any other boss that's probably out of range, I would just kill this Los Alfred Lord and then reset the zone. So if it was if it's only one boss that you kill, I would just reset 
using this band party. Uh, if it was two bosses, I would leave and restart the game to see if any fresh bosses popped up. And that's basically what I did for uh, for days. See right zone, and you see, you may notice every time you reset the zone, uh, you get fresh clickables. Uh, so if you do this often enough, you're going to pick up shrines. And as I said earlier, I had you know I had multiple times where I had over three hours worth of shrines, and uh, you're kind of obliged to <laughs> farm as much as possible when you've got shrines up. Um, when the game is so generous to you, and this is like a dream scenario. You've got double Heimdalls here, so in this case, it's definitely worth uh, walking up. So you see Heimdall on one on one edge of your screen. You start walking. You see an, a second one, and it's absolutely. Uh, quids in you definitely want to take these guys out so and of course the Fafnir's first you want you definitely want to kill Fafnir's first of all to get ornate cursed monster tombs uh, that's definitely one thing I, I was quite quick to get double ornate um, and as a because you know as a pet class when I was a pet class I literally had ornate witch staff legendary reaper's robe I got a lost helmet pretty soon as well but everything was like shit level one and just had cursed monster tombs i would just cast mimics mischief and the, the magic hammer would either uh would pretty much two shot every boss uh heimdall maybe and especially if you use sorrow too you only need to click once and then the your pet does the work so i basically farmed here all the way to tier 10 um when i reached tier 9 uh, you open up the Baylor zone uh, which is all of this it's a huge zone but even just to enter the zone the nearest way gate is in Northrin and you have to go all the way up here round before you even enter Baylor and then the pathing is up and down and up and down and all the way across here and then all the way down and then the depths of Baylor are here so in general the tier 9 bosses are I guess the average rewards are the same as a Heimdall boss, tier 8. The Immortal Lord and the Kraken are worth more in terms of rewards. But obviously, the tier 9 bosses are way more dangerous than the tier 8 bosses. So I had. I, I tried to make it work, uh, but the problem here, this area is so big. And we let's go there. And there are boss, there are a few boss spawns, but it's nowhere near dense enough, and it's nowhere near as efficient as farming the East Line as Strip. So this entire area, there's no bosses here. They can, I mean, the bosses in this zone. I don't know exactly what the spawn, what the spawning zones are in here. Um, maybe there's a boss all the way down here or here. Like, I don't even know. Let's see if we actually find a boss on the way. Uh, still, still don't see any boss. Like by now in, in the Lioness trip, you definitely would have found something. Um, so I ended up farming this area on the left, which is the the depths of Baylor here on the left. There's a mighty griffin there. Half because these uh, floors of lava is actually water spawn. You get water spawns there. So the Kraken boss does eventually spawn there. Pretty rare though, it felt. Cause just because it's such a small area compared to the the land in here and uh, so i farmed in here for like three or four hours at tier nine because as a as a pet class you're powerful enough your pet is powerful enough to take the bosses down and at tier nine by the way i switched to the big red basilisk initially which has like a tri cut and quad cut skill uh, but a problem with red big red it doesn't attack every turn especially when you're wearing tombs and look, I mean, there's just no bosses here, like. Um, and I don't even know why I'm going over here. I'm just showing you how bad it is right now. I, I reported this uh, as feedback to say there's, yeah, tier 90. This area could do with more boss spawning. Um, well, there's a Kelpie way, way down there. And, and you see the, the layout of this zone is like, you get boss spawning down here, but there's things in the way. You got to go up here, then down. Then up again, and then back around the corner. Uh, and there's always things that spawn just out of reach on this side. So if you're in this side of these uh, blocking stones, 
all his bosses just at our reach over there. So I, I tried to farm you for like three or four hours. Um, why I spent so long here, I don't know. I tried to make it work. Uh, I farmed up a couple of immortal jewels from immortal lords. I would only win maybe 20% of the fight with immortal lords. Uh, but the jewels, they do give you 100 HP. So I think I actually still have that in my Reaper's robe. Still have, yeah, three immortal jewels in there. And I stuck them in my, my head and my whatever legs I was wearing. You know, an extra five or 600 HP around tier 9, tier 8, tier 9. Well, tier 9. Uh, very useful indeed. Uh, but it was definitely a waste of time compared to tier 8. Um, so... I then was cutting about tier 9 with a fucking big red basilisk and I was uh, trying to think how I could get a better pet. How could I force either Nidhogg or Crimson Gazer? And this is when I had a flashback to old Facebook days. Some of you may remember Farmville, which was all the, all the craze for maybe, I don't know how long, a week, uh, a few weeks or a month or something like this. But I remember... Uh, in Farmville, you know, all my school was playing it. And there was a hack I found to get basically infinite gold where you could build hay bales, which cost maybe 10 gold, and then you could sell it for 15 gold or something like that. Basically, you could, you, you bought, you built it for less gold than you sold it for. So you could just build a bunch of, a line of hay bales and then sell them all and you'd come out with like 200 gold profit. Repeat ad infinitum. And, uh, that got me thinking, okay, how can, is there any way I can replicate something similar in uh, Hero of Aetheric? Because in this first week, I believe they, they're going to be changing it. But up until now, you can only build five bestries. And in the tier nine town, by the way, in Baylor, there is only a blacksmith right now. There's not even an, any pet uh, stores. So forget buying a uh, Nidhogg or Crimson Gazer in Baylor. So it was down to Origin Town. And as I said, you can only build five bestries at the time. Uh, it may be different now. And of course, when you build more than one bestry, you have increasing costs. Um, so yeah, I can build more shops. So probably you can build more bestries by now. But you see the build cost for, what, for your first bestry is 10 stone and 25 hide. You're building for the second one uh, 10 hone and 25 hide. I'm not sure that's correct. It should go up every time. Okay, well, I can guarantee you that in the when I was building these the first time, there was still it was still the same cost. Uh, sorry, it was not the same cost. It was going up every time. It was doubling every fucking time. Anyway, so it seems like you can build more bestries now. But regardless of that, you can only build a maximum of five. So what I did was, rather than waiting 24 hours for them to restock, by which time I would be, someone else would probably get tier 10 first, upgrade it, build a new bestry. Well, first, of, first of all, destroy all your bestries uh, after checking, of course, that if there's anything there. Build a new one, level it to nine, check the stock. There's a warhorse there. Check the stock, upgrade it to tier 10. You get another roll of the dice, see if there's anything good. Nothing good here. And then what you do is destroy this. And you just build a new bestiary. Right. And to be fair, the thought process is the same in that, I guess, even if they increase the maximum amount of bestiaries and the, the price is still cheap, you still have to wait for X amount of time for bestiaries to roll over. With this method, I could maybe get 20, 30, 40 chances immediately of finding Nidhogg or Crimson Gazer. And after a couple of new bestry builds, I found Nidhogg, who was such an upgrade to Big Red Basilisk, it's not even funny. Uh, Nidhogg is an absolute beast. Okay, nothing there, but check out my, my home. And I can show you got uh, Got the Nidhogg there. So yeah, this Nidhogg is basically what carried me uh, to tier 10. Uh, basically with, with tier, nine, tier 9 with Nidhogg, excellent damage, 
one shots all the tier 8 bosses and uh, with Heimdall I just use a, a twin blast to get damage in first turn and then Nitog will finish it off so yeah you're one shotting all the tier 8 bosses on the lioness strip and then I was kind of around let's say level 200 to 210 211 still farming the lioness strip I realized that Chaos Scrolls, these bad boys, if I still have one, Chaos Scrolls, so these make enemies of any weather and biome, well, they, they make weather-dependent mobs spawn outside of weather dependencies, like, and they also make more berserks spawn. Now, in this game, and this may be true in Orna, I don't know if anyone's ever tested this, but in Aetheric, it also makes more Berserk bosses spawn. And this is really what gave me the edge in the race to tier 10, because with Nidhogg as a Bahamut Tamer, not only could I one-shot normal non-Berserk bosses, but I could one-shot all Berserk bosses except Heimdall's. Uh, just by using Mimic Mischief turn one. And so, and with Heimdall, I could just use uh, Rampart three, get a bit of ward, then use Mimic Mischief, and it would still die in three turns. Yes, I'm, when Heimdall uses his uh, multi hitting skill, I forget exactly what it's called. Is it uh, quad cut? It might, it might be quad cut, you know. Let me just check what it is, because he did take me down a few times. Yeah, quad cut. If he uses that turn one, I was normally dead. But using a Chaos Scroll with uh, Nidhogg and, and Shrines is like a cheat code. I was getting... Uh, I used seven Chaos Scrolls and I got from level 211 all the way up to 220 in uh, like one day uh, while farming. So I only had seven Chaos Scrolls, unfortunately. Um, and I got all of those seven while farming for arcane arrows in the arena around tier five. Um, you see, it's a tier four item. So, trying to find arcane arrows level fucking 100 in the arena. Picked up seven of these. Realized 100 levels later, okay, I need these for my push. Uh, so, I w of course, I went back in the arena. But by the way, there was only... Actually, when I first reached 220, there was nobody else in the arena, so I couldn't couldn't kill anyone, first of all, and I'd used all my Chaos Scrolls. So I had to wait for the next morning until Inklings reached 220. Uh, Inklings farmed um, a lot as well. So he reached 220, and then I went back in the arena the next morning, and I killed him 700 times, and I only got two Chaos Scrolls out of it. So... Really inefficient compared to farming low level. So if there's one thing you want to speed up uh, your kind of farming later on is that when you're low level, tier 4, tier 5, yeah, use your arena tokens. Try and find a build that can kill things really fast. Dragoon, Elder Gnome, great shout. Farm a bunch of Chaos Scrolls because they'll become, they'll come in useful, uh, super useful later on. And they become super rare later on, at least from the arena. Once you reach tier 10, you, you actually have much more uh, Mimic kills, like Arisen Mimics, and they are part of the Mimic uh, loot pool as well. But until tier 10, it's very rare to find Mimics. Um, they did change the the spawning, like their forest models were not spawning before. You can now find uh, Mimic Kings in uh, Odin's Finger. Uh, but at the time, I was uh, not able to do that. So probably... Yeah, I mean, tier 4, tier 5, that's a good leveling zone. Anyway, Odin's Fingers, try and kill Mimic Kings. They give lots of Orns and XP as well uh, at that level. So, yeah, killing... If you can kill Zerg bosses easily, it's, it's, in my opinion, worth more than a Shrine. It's like more than, it giving you more than double uh, rewards. I mean, when you kill a Zerg, it basically gives you triple rewards. And uh, when you're resetting bosses that fast, uh, you're, you're very regularly getting Berserk bosses. But of course... Team that up with shrines, and uh, the boosting the level boosting is just insane. So that is really what happened. 
uh, I farm this zone going left and right, left and right, disbanding party, inviting my ult to a new party, leaving the game, joining the game again. Did that about a thousand times, maybe more. And uh, I ended up hitting tier 10 with just over, yeah, four and a half hours of playtime, I think. Uh, sorry, four and a half days of uh, four and a half days of playtime. Uh, I don't know what we're saying at now. I think we're still tier one, uh, rank one. So rank one, even though there's no leaderboard, I can tell you right now, I'll be I'm global rank one. That will not be staying forever. Uh, I can guarantee you there. Playtime four days. Uh, yeah, it was just about. It was just out for over a week and put over four days of playtime in. So uh, that's how much I was playing. And yeah, as always, want to thank all the Arisen Orna Legends for supporting me on Patreon and Twitch and Discord. Really appreciate all your support. And I want to thank you for watching this video. If you got this far, uh, thank you very much. Hope it was an interesting story. I probably will not be rushing to first uh, 250 in Aetheric, but uh, who knows? I actually already found one ornate Arisen Monster Tomb and a couple of legendaries, which is actually pretty funny because in Orna, on my first character, main character, Shabash, I leveled to 250 without ever finding an ornate Arisen monster tomb. I used two legendaries. I drove miles and miles trying to find Arisen Fafnirs in the world uh, to pick up Arisen monster tombs. And... Uh, Basically, in Hero of A3, I found uh, an ornate and legendary within a couple of hours at tier 10, uh, which is, yeah, pretty funny. Comment below if you think I should rush to World First 250 or whether I should take my life back. Let me know what you think, and we'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Ciao.